this morning uh, in the session on climate socialism, um, a number of comrades uh, said that they were looking forward to something more uplifting. I'm not sure whether I can provide that. In fact, I might probably add to, uh, to some of the gloom, uh, certainly uh, the record of the British Labour Party isn't, uh, you know, is not a positive one. Although for those people, those of us who live in Britain and indeed for many other people, it's a very significant political fact of life. And um, rather like the, the um, W.S. Gilbert song from Iolanthe, about uh, uh, the 19th century politics. I won't attempt to sing it or scan it properly, but um, essentially that every little boy and gal alive is either a little liberal or a conservative. And, um, you know, for many people, indeed for most people in Britain who follow politics to any, in, to any extent, it's a sort of fact of life that you are either going to primarily choose to be a Labour supporter, voter, or um, or a Conservative, and uh, it's in a sense a sort of a you know a natural part of politics, reinforced by our electoral system, and so the significance of the Labour Party for for the left, and indeed for anybody that's got any form of commitment to changing society, is a is an important one. It's it's not something that we can ignore, even if we, for example, as I do, see the Labour Party's ideology and organisation as actually an obstacle um, and a barrier to the, uh, to the construction of socialism. And uh, it's, it's a, an obstacle that we have to both overcome, but also to, um, to explain. And rather like um, the comments this morning on whether climate socialism was an appropriate term, um, I think we might also question whether labour socialism is, um, is an appropriate term as well. Uh, Lenin, when he was um, uh, looking at uh, the Labour Party, and uh, when I was preparing for the talk, I looked over some of Lenin's writings, and he'd written quite a bit even before the First World War and had a certain degree of personal experience when, on the times when he lived in London. Uh, Iskra, for example, was prepared in the offices of justice um, and he you know, writes from a certain personal knowledge about the nature of British socialism and the Labour Party. But he does make the point that MacDonald in particular was able to use the language of socialism and he struck, for example, how in the years following the Russian Revolution, particularly that critical period, 1917 to 1920, when, when people in Britain are discussing whether to form a communist party and its relationship to labor and to electoralism, he does comment on the ability of labor leaders, such as MacDonald, to actually draw on you know, left, the, the left's position and um, he quotes extensively from MacDonald, who at one point is, is actually talking about uh, a socialist revolution and about the victory of the proletariat. So the, the, the language of the British Labour Party can often appear to be on the left. And indeed, um, not only the, the sort of natural structures of British politics, but actually the way that um, politics are formed around the idea that Labour does represent the left. And in, in, in terms of the Conservatives, um, their attacks on Labour as a, a left-wing party, um, that's fairly difficult for them to do at the moment. Um, this week's Spectator, for example, has uh, some advice to the Tories that demonising Keir Starmer as some sort of red uh, turning him to some sort of um, you know, extremist isn't probably going to work. But there is an established pattern, and again, of seeing Labour as, as again, the old usage, one I remember from, from my youth, is that the, many of the Tories would refer to the Labour Party as the socialists. And uh, we were all, all expected to know who and what that meant. So... The Labour then, a significant force, understanding 
labour uh, quite important for us. It isn't just something that we can easily dismiss or indeed that we can just simply take at face value. Um, in, my, uh, in my academic life, I've often um, had to do introductions to politics and um, there are a whole series of sort of standard textbooks which look at ideologies uh, you know the usual ones socialism fascism so on and so on and um, also these textbooks cover the, the different political parties and um, they give a potted history an outline of its uh, ideology and so on one of the problems i think uh, with looking at the british labor party is that it has a, a fairly poor a very limited theoretical tradition so that even um, even looking at ideologies that we we think of as fairly incoherent or diffuse or hard to pin down they often have a body of uh, texts articles manifestos so on and so on that help students and help us understand exactly where they're coming from the British Labour Party, I think, lacks that tradition. Again, Lenin comments extensively on this, talks about their dislike of theory. He refers to the English, and uh, he uses that rather old fashioned term, and I think he means British. Um, he, he talks about their sort of uh, disdain for theory and their uh, pragmatism. And I think in, in some ways, if we're trying to uncover what labor socialism is, we have to look at both the, the actions of labor leaders um, as much as we have to look at, uh, at you know, a normal a body of uh, theoretical or written work. Um, there are a number of examples, and again, comrades will be familiar with them, and I don't intend to go into them in great detail, but the, they would begin with the webs, but also you could argue Heinemann in England for all, um the, the webs in the fabian tradition uh through to mcdonald and then later uh, later people like aniram bevins in place of fear um anthony crosslands um you know the future of socialism uh, tony ben's various pamphlets um even up to the relatively contemporary last 30 years or so uh, people like anthony giddens writing about the third way so there is a body of material, but um, it's, I think, in comparison with the, the Marxist tradition, and I'd even say the continental social democratic tradition, its theoretical output is, is fairly poor and uh, really quite limited in that way. When, um, when I've, I've tried to teach this, uh, and I'm just to put comrades and minds at rest, you're not going to get my standard first year uh, lectures or seminars on, um, on, on this. Uh, it will be hopefully better and different. But when I have tried to, to do this, I've, um, I've asked my students, you know, what, what is Labour's ideology? What does Labour stand for? And I often get a series of sort of quite general aspirations um, usually around policy prescriptions rather than uh, clear ideology. And above all, uh, very little reference to socialism. It's interesting, certainly with the contemporary student, that the references are often to policy prescriptions about public spending, the welfare state, levels of taxation, and that the, the idea of a socialist society clearly doesn't figure largely uh, there. But what is interesting in the follow up discussions, and again, I think this is quite a, a well established theme and particularly one that's uh, common amongst Labour supporters and indeed those, uh, you know, in the broad sense on the left, is that there's often uh, an idea that Labour did stand for something, that it did stand, for example, socialism, something akin to that, but there have been a series of retreats and indeed betrayals uh, of that. And uh, it's quite an amusing game. Uh, I find it amusing just to try and disabuse them of this, to always try to get them to locate when this betrayal occurred and who did it. So for example, when I did this in the 2000s, uh, Blair was excoriated as having departed from 
you know, socialism and, and Labour's true values, usually around the question of the war. And um, so I said, well, the usual type would be, well, who was, uh, who, you know, if, if we rule out Blair, who comes, you know, they hadn't heard much of John Smith. He, did, he wasn't around very long. So we'd start talking about Neil Kinnock. And again, uh, once I pointed out what Neil Kinnock had done politically, um, they said, OK, well, maybe Kinnock wasn't, wasn't that. And you know what I'm going to say is that we went back through the whole history of the Labour Party and we found that all of the, the great lefts of the past weren't quite as left as they thought. Although we did manage to get back to Keir Hardy and um, because he hadn't, for example, he'd not been in government and um, he was uh, identified as an authentic working class leader, he sort of, he just about survived but it was the 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 sort of the the narrative of betrayal, and uh, the narrative that Labour once stood for something, but had um, you know abandoned this. But we couldn't in in the discussions we couldn't identify exactly when that had happened, and I think that's because it didn't really work out like that. And um, I think it's very clear that we need to look at this historically, not only in terms of the ideology of uh, laborism, but also of its organizational and its political form. And uh, so I'm going to try and uh, approach this question by starting with some sort of general premises and then attempt to illustrate them by particular um, references. Obviously, you know, the time available uh, doesn't allow me to go into uh, some of the, the particular aspects in great detail, but I hope that comrades will come in uh, from the floor on, on that. Um, what I want to um, what I want to assert is really to start with what I think is the standard position of of most Marxists. Uh, certainly, it's a phrase that um, Engels, I think Marx may also have used it, but Engels certainly did about labour. Uh, about a bourgeois labor party. Uh, the, the, the phrase bourgeois workers party is used later by Lenin, but, but Engels certainly talks about um, the ILP and um, also the so-called Lib Labs in the uh, 1880s and the 1890s in terms of being uh, a bourgeois labor party. And this then flows back to the relationship of the British working class, uh, both as a, as a class, but also in its political representations to British capitalism and to British imperialism. So my argument is that from its beginnings, not at some stage, say around the First World War, or when it becomes the main opposition after the First World War, or when it, when it goes into government, or at, at some other point then, my point is that the very origins of the party make it a bourgeois workers' party, unlike, say, German social democracy, which began as a revolutionary movement. And then um, we, we know about its degeneration and what happened in 1914. But it, it means that from its very inception, Labour has that relationship to the, to the state, to, to capitalism, to imperialism. So it, it doesn't start, I think, as a, a, as a party of extreme opposition, doesn't start as a revolutionary party. It doesn't, for example, start essentially as a socialist party. It starts um, in some ways as a, it, it's, it's got a number of elements within it. But I would argue uh, both from its inception and then its subsequent history that Labour is actually essentially part of the state, that its, uh, its orientation is towards the state, uh, that it's, it, never, it never as a, a, a party was, was clear about overthrowing the state. It, it, it probably could be defined as a, a attempting to negotiate or to mediate uh, between capitalism and the working class. But it, it derives that character, I think, from its origins primarily in the trade unions as a representational body of the trade unions, uh, particularly of the, the uh, labor aristocracy, 
and particularly because of its previous um, relationship with uh, with the Liberal Party, um, many of the um, many of the people who were leading elements in the early years of the Labour Party had been liberal activists. And I think it's probably accurate to see their ideology insofar as we can define it very clearly as a form of liberalism. Uh, the adhesion or the adherence, sorry, of uh, groups like the uh, the Miners Federation of Great Britain in 1908 brought into Labour representation in Parliament a whole group of MPs who were essentially members of the Liberal Party. And they functioned very much as a pressure group acting on the Liberal Party. Lenin makes um, a, you know, quite a strong point of this when he's discussing uh, whether the Labour Party should be allowed to affiliate to the uh, Second International. And he talks about the, the, ideal, the ideology of Labourism uh, as a representational um, element, working class representational element. But even, even for those elements which um, uh, favour some, some sort of break with liberalism, or um, in indeed a rejection of, uh, of aspects of liberalism, particularly uh, in terms of social reform, it's still very much, I think, within uh, a broadly liberal framework. Um, there are some currents, which I'll, I'll talk about, which do have some uh, conceptions of socialism, but these still work within essentially a parliamentary and a, uh, um, you know, the, the established constitutional order. The, um, the other point that I, I, I want, to, uh, want to, to really stress is that the nature of British society, particularly British imperialism and the, the class nature of Britain, also I think very strongly influences the Labour Party. Um, we know that in the 19th century, uh, I mean, Mark Mulholland referred to it in his, uh, in his opening talk, we know that the, uh, the growth of working class parties and indeed the working class as a, uh, as a coherent body that had to be accommodated within politics was a, a major issue for the, um, for the ruling class. How, how it dealt with the working class uh, was once it had come onto the scene, uh, but, you know, after 1848 in particular, is a major strategic and political problem. And Marx and Engels in particular write about this. They discuss um, how this might develop and on occasions uh, refer to the, the, the strength of the petty bourgeoisie. Um, they re re talk about the, the way that um, the, the, the British working class has become, um, in a sense, uh, incorporated. And they, they, they see the sort of double-edged weapon of the extension of the franchise, which gives the working class the potential of uh, mobilizing politically and of developing its own politics and its own um, political um, demands, but also the way that it can be incorporated, and particularly through the medium of uh, the trade unions. So we, we, this, this issue of, of how states responded, how capitalist classes respond to the working class is generally in Britain worked around ideas of building consent. And indeed, as, um, as is quite a, a common theme, the ability of imperialism, the ability of British capitalism to give various material concessions uh, to, the, to the working class means that that stratum uh, of the working class, particularly organized in the skilled unions, will then be, I think, you know, it's then potentially uh, accommodated in that way. Um, the other, the other important point, I think, is the uh, ideological hegemony of capitalist ideas and uh, the, the weakness of uh, uh, an alternative uh, political um, program, uh, alternative politics. So again, we have, um, we have um, this, uh, 
this real issue of um, how the how the state uh, attempts to incorporate, and in particular how the state uh, will um, offer concessions and how it will deal with this uh, this emerging working class. Um, I think also we have to look at the nature of the state. And again, I'm, I'm looking over the long period now, moving really through uh, the history of the Labour Party. And that is that the, is that the Labour Party is not only, in a sense, um, you know, part of the state, uh, it's, it's born as, a, as an institution, as a structure, it's part of, uh, of uh, bourgeois politics. And often we might see the Labour Party as in a sense, you know, um, dependent on the state, that it simply inserts itself into the state, it accommodates and sort of goes along with the state as it were. But I think if we look at the development of the state, particularly from 1945 onwards, and I'm thinking particularly during the long boom period, that the Labour Party in many senses creates that state. So that if we see the state simply as a, um, uh, uh, I, th I think it was Mike McNair in a session a few years ago compared the state to a, a type of fortress, the comrades may be aware of those, 17th and 18th century fortresses, which had a series of curtain walls, so that it, uh, the pattern of the fortress looked rather like a series of stars with a series of walls that you had to break through and get to the, the center of the fortress through several walls and outworkings and fortifications. Well, L Labour is, uh, the, the Labour Party is both um, you know, part of that, that structure, um, but it also helps to shape it as well. So it's, um, it's both a way of keeping out uh, potential insurgents, but also a way of drawing them in. And perhaps more importantly, that state, and I, I'm thinking particularly of the post-45 welfare state, is one that's constructed by labor so that when we think of the importance of, of Labour, it's not just as a representational political party, it's also as something that actually has helped to create that state. Um, and that again puts it in, I suppose, the same way that the, uh, that the SPD and its relationship to Weimar, um, it might also uh, figure in the way that Christian democracy helps to shape the state in, in other European states. So Labour then is, isn't just a political party. I think it's a clearly part of the state itself. And that's, uh, that's very much there, you know, at its beginnings uh, in that way. Um, the, other, the other issue, I think, is that it's ideology. And um, Lenin, I think, draws these conclusions fairly clearly during the First World War. Uh, although I think if we look at his remarks on the Labour Party uh, when it's, uh, was its application to join the Second International in about 1908, I think, um, he's fairly clear that its ideology is essentially bourgeois. And he, um, he analyzes particular parties and trends, even, even those that we might now think of as being on the left, and indeed, as, as part of our, and by our, I mean those of, you know, wider British society, um, our understandings of the, of, of the left. So, for example, the ILP, uh, Lenin criticizes in terms of their um, non-class politics, that they are, for example, ethical and moralizing. And he again quotes uh, quite extensively from their material, looking at the at the first, in, sorry, the second international. Uh, Bruce Glazier, for example, is um, one of their leading writers. Um, he, um, he complains that in continental Europe, people are always banging on about class war and that there isn't a moral or ethical element. And that, uh, that is, I think, more than a stylistic question. I think that's more uh, 
is about more than just Bruce Glazier saying that he didn't like these rather dogmatic continentals. And it's very easy to sort of portray, you know, the, um, the pragmatic British against the dogmatic continentals. But I think it's also, it talks about how far um, this form of socialism and the ILP's form of socialism is, I think, going to be an important strand. Um, it, it leaves its imprint long after the ILP itself leaves the Labour Party in 1932, which is to be very much a product of sort of moral reformation. So it has very much the angle of the, the Victorian social um, improvers. Um, it, it actually sees changing society in many ways as a, a form of sort of moral crusade. Um, often, you know, very much like the re religious revivalists who are trying to um, change the way people see the world, how they behave. And of course, this then fits into uh, this non-conformist religious tradition, um, which many of the uh, many of the ILP activists come from. So that, again, will be an important strand in its ideology. And of course, it it links back to perhaps a more fundamental um, point about what the, the, the political aims are. And that is the, the transformation of society, not through the transformation of social, economic, or even political structures, but in a sense, a sort of, sort of form of moral crusade and reformation, almost like sort of being born again uh, in that way that, that people will Will, will improve their behavior, that they will, they will in a sense, become fairer, uh, they will become more tolerant, and they will, you know, act in a very charitable way um, uh, in that way. The other element uh, in terms of the relationship with the state, and again, I'm looking at the period largely before 1914, although I think this again continues uh, really up until the 1940s, and I, I think there's still elements of it uh, around at the moment in terms of uh, Labour's socialism, is the, the nature of the British state. Um, before uh, the, the 1950s, and I think even, even as recently as the 1980s, a considerable amount of initiative um, was uh, capable of being exercised by local government institutions. And indeed in the, in the 19th century, and again, into the, the, the pre second world war period, socialism as a sort of municipal project, socialism in one town um, could, you know, could be carried out to a certain extent. So much of the, uh, much of the later uh, policies of uh, late labor government uh, particularly the 1945 government, had been trialled or had been organised on a local level. Um, the welfare state not only has its origins in the, the new liberal reforms of the pre-First World, World War period, and then the, those are transmitted through beverage into the, um, the white paper in the, in the midst of the Second World War. But they're also in the practice of labour local authorities, which from the 1890s have a considerable degree of local power and are able to carry out uh, welfare reforms. For example, trans, um, transforming uh, workhouses into essentially old people's homes and hospitals, uh, maternity care, um, uh, you know, uh, antenatal care, um, even, even uh, in terms of education, um, even th things like sort of school school meals and so on. In other words, the um, a lot of immediate reformist demands were quite capable of being achieved and carried out. So this, I think, reinforced the the sort of pragmatism, but also the relationship to the state and the idea that the state uh, could be a, a neutral instrument for carrying out um, uh, socialist aims which were largely seen as furthering the interests of the organized working class and um, you know, bringing particular benefits. But they all rest, I think, on a particular relationship with that state. And that 
it, it, you know, I think is really quite fundamental. So unlike, say, German social democracy, which had a, uh, a tradition of antipathy to the state, again, we're, we're all quite familiar with that, and is only really reconciled formally to the state um, after Weimar. I mean, I know the, the First World War, uh, Borgfrieden is, is, is quite important in that process. But I think the, um, the British laborism has this relationship to the state that's really there, you know, from the, from the beginning. The, um, the, other, um, the other issue in, in these early years of, uh, of laborism are, I think, a, a sense of historical progress and also, I think, evolution, which we would most clearly see uh, in the Fabian tradition. Uh, on Friday, um, Mark Mulholland referred to uh, a book by Sidney Webb on the constitution of the socialist Commonwealth. And uh, I did a little bit of looking around uh, following that. And I think that Lenin does make a reference to it in one of his attacks on the Fabians. And um, it, it, it's not explicit, he doesn't cite the particular book. But what he does do is to talk about the, the Fabians having a, a conception of socialism. And he talks about their sort of detailed critiques and indeed um, their, um, you know, their policy and, and other proposals. He says that, uh, and I think, he, I think he's accurate in this, he says that the, the Fabians do have a conception of, the, of changing capitalism, but they see this uh, operating in two ways. One is a form of evolution, that capitalism is moving in a particular direction, and that their job is to, um, is to assist in that. Uh, initially, it's through a policy of permeation of existing bourgeois parties, but then once Labour emerges as a force, they decide to throw their lot in there. Although, I think it's, it's, still, as, um, it's still as late as 1918 before they really become committed to the idea of Labour being a, a, a party that they could work with, and m many of them still would hanker after a sort of broad progressivism uh, involving the Liberals. But the other key point, and this is where I think um, this um, relationship with the state becomes important, is the, um, is the idea that the working class as a class uh, is, is either limited <clears throat> or indeed is actually incapable of acting in its own interests. And we might, I think, see Fabianism, uh, partly because of the social origins of many of its um, leading figures, but also because of this strand, I think, will appear in bourgeois politics and from there will come into the Labour Party, which is that um, the British capitalism is facing, um, you know, long-term uh, systemic problems. Uh, ideas of decline, uh, the, the debates on national efficiency before 1914, but perhaps feeding back, uh, oh, sorry, going forward into both the 30s and uh, up into the 1960s, the debates about British decline and indeed the need for greater efficiency and modernization uh, or focus on the agency that can carry that out. Now, you know, for Marx, it's the agency that can transform society is, of course, the working class. For the Fabians, uh, the working class are incapable of doing that. Um, in, in their more disdainful moments, they suggest that this might, not only that the working class can't carry it out, but it will lead to all sorts of, um, you know, dangerous experiments. It will be, um, it will be in a way rather like the the nineteenth century aristocrat looking down on mob rule. It will be uh, fraught with dangers and worries. So, although the tendency in society is towards um, collective uh, ownership, and again, this is drawn clearly from Marxism, 
that uh, society is um, is moving towards uh, social production, but it's still in in the hands of um, you know individual or groups of capitalists. The, the the aim then of the Fabian is to replace those with uh, techno technocracy, with managerialism, and indeed in some of its more rarefied forms, and again, the, the work of H.G. Wells and George Bernard Shaw exemplifies this, of a type of technocratic scientific elite that will you know, enlighten and guide us in that way. Now, that, uh, that idea, I think, very much reflects a section of British capitalism, particularly British intelligentsia, as a response to the crisis of British capitalism. And we can see that I think echoed later in the 1960s with the, the white heat of technology. And even I would, I would say echoes of it in the rhetoric of Blair uh, in the 1990s, the idea of modernization of change and above all of making British society capable of responding to that change, making the population resilient and, and able to, um, to, to deal with the, the new globalized world or the new competition. Um, and notice that within, within this uh, narrative of evolution, there's also a, a narrative, a theme of progress and the so-called forward march of labor. And this again is, a, is, I think, an interesting element where laborism is very much part of the mainstream of British society, so that the, the emergence of a modern democracy, the emergence of a welfare state, um, are seen as part of Britain's uh, historical evolution. Certainly the way that that was taught, the way that that was regarded, meant that labor as a, as a representative of the working class, but also a representative of forms of historical progress, was entirely legitimate. This wasn't the, um, the sort of 19th century mob bursting onto the stage and taking over. This was seen as a type of emancipation. And again, the forward march of labor, rather like the, the charts that I used to have on my um, classroom wall of, uh, uh, of different human types. You, you'll remember the way that we start off as various forms of ape and then eventually we stand upright well, presumably the, the, the full standing upright is a Labour government and the earlier stages are uh, of our ignorance and our um, you know, coming to maturity. And this is, this is brought into the British national story so that Labour, far from being uh, challenges to that story, are in fact uh, an important part of it. And it is, it's interesting, for example, to look at school books school history books um, in general from the 50s and 60s, which actually show that, which actually sort of place labor, um, you know, the, the, the changes that the emergence of labor brings about as all part of, of, of our national story. So that labor has its place, it's brought into the system, it then functions within that system uh, in that way. Now, we can, uh, you know, we can look over the whole history of labor and we can see the way that these things might work through. And I think there's a danger of being sort of slightly ahistorical and um, doing what I've done to sort of range far and wide, because it's obvious that, that politics takes particular conjunctural forms. It works, um, um, it works, you know, it, at particular times in different ways. Um, so it, you know, it, it is perhaps wrong to just talk in, in, in these in broad terms. It's also, I think, um, important while we, we talk about this relationship of the bourgeois workers' party, and we see Labour as, as being formed in that way, and I would suggest continuing to function in that way. But it, it would be it would be important as well to look at other possible trajectories for labor or indeed to to think about how whether that that formulation of the relationship between the bourgeois and the workers element in the labor party whether that is both eternal 
and indeed whether it might be changed and indeed the the nature of Labour uh, as a party, as an ideology might change. Um, the um, sort of conventional uh, analysis, um, um, the conventional analysis, I think, is often of a sort of framework in, in labor history of left versus right, of swings, uh, almost a sort of Manichaean pattern. And um, again, all of the, the standard texts talk about this. They, they draw parallels of particular periods. But I think that it's, um, it, it, there are a couple of periods, and indeed they are periods within recent political memory, and indeed I think we may be in one now, where that uh, pendulum um, and indeed that relationship might be uh, open to uh, some quite fundamental change. Blairism in the, uh, in the 1990s was seen by many people as really quite a fundamental break. And indeed for some groups who had been uh, working in the Labour Party, I'm, I'm thinking of various Trotskyist groupings who had been, uh, uh, and also some sections of the Labour left as well, saw the Blair period as really quite a fundamental break. And they saw that Blair's openly capitalist ideology was, um, was in a sense, destroying any connections with, uh, with its Labourist past. Now, I think that I think that's not entirely accurate. I think that that um, in emphasizing the complete break, it tends to um, uh, overstate the uh, the coherence and the leftism and the socialism and so on of of the Labour Party before the 1990s. And it is, as I say, part of this rhetoric of betrayal, this um, this way that we hold up. Labour's traditions as the um, as a standard, and we then point out that that Tony Blair or Keir Starmer don't uh, don't really ring true to them, and that that of course is, is is a problem, particularly with the politics of militant, and I would have said the politics of socialist appeal before their more recent turn towards a uh, open revolution um, and moving away from that that those sets of demands around the election of a Labour government. But it, it is, um, although you can, you can argue that, that Blair stands in relation to, um, you know, the Fabians or to, to previous um, social democratic uh, politicians. Um, if, we, if we look at Giddens' work, for example, it has clear links with, uh, with Crossland's The Future of Socialism. I think that there is um, the potential, and I think this is, we're perhaps now entering into this uh, period with Starmer, of a, of a, of a break between, uh, or certainly a, a severe fraying of the relationship between uh, the Labour leadership, uh, particularly the parliamentary party, and, uh, and the organised working class. In other words, a sort of de -laborization and that would that would involve, I suppose, the exaggeration of those tendencies, both in its ideology, but also um, in its organizational structure, which um, would move towards ideas of the nation, of the community, and above all, of sort of ditching the the unions, and indeed those click those clear roots in the organized working class. Now again. We, we, we could look at the, the history of relations between labor governments and the trade unions. Um, you know, going back to the very first labor government, which is uh, involved in using troops against docker strikes. We can, uh, we can talk about in place of strife in the, 19, um, in the 1960s. We, we, you know, there's, there's clear, you know, this is not a unique phenomenon of labor leaders um, not representing the interests of the unions and indeed being openly pro-capitalist. That, of course, is implicit in Labour. So there's, 
not a surprise there. But I think it's when it becomes um, a central part of the project, when their, their politics uh, not only um, in practice uh, uh, have no connections with the interests of the working class, but even rhetorically move away from that, then I think we, we, we could start to see that sort of delaborization. Um, that's because the other facts that I wanted to bring in, as well as, uh, as, well as the, the ideology, is of course the, the nature of its leadership. And that again, makes labor politicians, uh, I would suggest again from, from the very beginning, uh, essentially as careerist uh, politicians, so that they function as parliamentarians, um, they, they have careers, they, um, they, they seek their, their own personal advancement, as well as representing the various interests that send them there. Um, uh, again, the, the histories of tensions within the organization uh, show that, 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 that contradiction. Um, as early again as 97, 98, uh, the parliamentary uh, party effectively declares itself an independent grouping from the, the, the Labour Party outside of Parliament. And that's, um, you know, that's with the approval of people who would later be considered to be uh, on the left. Um, likewise, um, we can see the trajectory of Labour through, um, through the role of those, uh, those particular individual politicians as just simply becoming part of standard bourgeois politics. This again, within, within labor history and within the, um, the, you know, the traditions uh, that have grown up around the party has often turned on individual betrayal and careerism. The career of um, Ramsay McDonald is a good example of that, but it's, uh, it's fairly, you know, fairly plain we can hear the same comments on people like Neil Kinnock, Harold Wilson, and so on. And I think why we need to be clear about why this, this narrative of betrayal, um, you know, leaving aside the personal characteristics of the individuals concerned, is that it, it gives a, a, a wrong analysis of the nature of the party itself. So if we if we take the idea that Labour was is a potential instrument for socialist advance, which many of the Labour left do, if we take that argument that um, it's uh, a, a site of struggle uh, a, and simply a site of struggle, with the idea that it can be won in some sense, that it's a battleground. Um, as someone who was involved in the, the Labour left uh, really came into the, came back into politics through the Corbyn movement, I think I would have um, initially had the idea that a, a, a left wing could be built and that that left wing could be in, you know, quite significant in terms of the leadership. Uh, it could act to pressurize that leadership and it could actually, you know, develop I, I hoped it would move in a more general left wing uh, and what I think probably would at that time I would have considered a Marxist uh, direction. But in seeing Labour as a site of struggle, that to me sees it, or simply expressing it in that way, that sort of portrays it as being potentially uh, an area that can be sort of transformed as, as an instrument. In other words, it's not a case of winning large numbers of people who are on the left in the Labour Party to a, to a Marxist program and to the need to build a Marxist party, it's actually seeing Labour as the basis for that. And I think that I, like quite a few other people, were wrong in, in, in overestimating that and seeing it in that way. And I think our mistake came from a misunderstanding of the nature of the Labour Party historically that we probably still carried with us and you know, the strength of laborism um, as, a, as a form of politics, I think is very great. It's hold uh, over you know, official communists 
uh, as well as um, some elements of the Trotskyists left in Britain, is very great. But I think that we we misunderstood the, the nature of labor from the very beginning. Not that it had somehow you know, lost its way, that actually it had been established by politicians and it, its relations with ruling class parties and with the state were much more fundamental. So that our understanding of, of a movement that in a sense grown up outside of parliament was accurate, it, you know, it did grow up from the trade unions and from socialist groups. But those leaders of, of those socialist groups and those leaders of the unions were, uh, you know, essentially integrated into that state. And that wasn't just their own uh, personal backgrounds. Um, you know, some early Labour leaders, some early Labour MPs went, to, went into bureaucratic positions. We know the class backgrounds of people like Starmer and Blair. It's also their political orientation. So I think, I think having an understanding of the history of the party, both in its origins, but also how it, it is formed and has become part of the state, and as I say, has actually constructed that state. And I think particularly the welfare state that emerges in the, in the 40s and 50s, which the Conservatives do very little to, um, to, to break up. They modify it, but they, they essentially keep it. Um, is, I think, you know, a, a, a key feature. So that means that although um, we could foresee, uh, you know, developments in the future through the Labour Party, the experience of Corbynism, and indeed the, our experience of the history of that party, shows the limitations of, of, of those sorts of politics. So, Comrade, it's been a fairly wide-ranging uh, you know, survey over about 123 years. Um, and there are some very important areas which I haven't dealt with, but I, I wanted to make this central point, and I hope that has uh, come across, um, how we, we understand that and then how we orient it towards it, what sort of demands we make, um, I think can come up. But as, as I've done in previous talks, when I've talked about the importance of a communist party, both, uh, in and of itself, but also in its impact that that Communist Party has over the Labour left. Again, I think historically has been demonstrated from the 1920s onwards. We've had a, a series of sessions at previous communist universities which have looked at that. So I'm not, I'm not downplaying that uh, at all, but in trying to focus on the, the relationship of Labour to the state, and in, in particular, the relationship of labor to bourgeois ideology, uh, I wanted to sort of really ram that point home. Uh, and in that, I'm directing my remarks really towards people on the labor left and people really like myself, who I think had you know, tremendous um, illusions in, in the way that that party could be you know, possibly transformed. So this is, uh, this is something of a confessional uh, session. Um, it is a Sunday after all, so uh, our thoughts should turn to higher things. And um, um, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there and throw it open to, uh, to questions and comments.